This is the Rex, uh, I guess, alumni call for Wednesday, May 10th, 2023. Um, welcome. Good to welcome. see you. Hello, hello. There we go. Turn on the transcript as well. Um, we were just doing weather talk, Brad, because yeah. weather, weather's acting strange. And it's finally pretty here in Portland, but it's going to turn over 90 in a couple of days. So there we go. Seriously? Yeah. Wow, I don't know how Southern how long, California but... uh, survived all of its rain, so you know we're good. We'll uh, we'll see what happens when the uh, uh, snow starts melting. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding. Is that no big kidding. lake going to restart in the center of the state? It could. We'll it could. Yeah, I um, uh, daddy daughter camping group that I was a part of when my girls were in elementary school. Now they're 13 and 14 um, but a bunch of those 13 year olds are going on a whitewater rafting trip and originally they had booked a class two and then it got bumped up to a class three and now it's a half a day with a class four um, just because of the runoff so that's Great. really interesting yeah that's going to be a good good for rafting excursions <laughs> yeah um there was I've a... never I've never done whitewater rafting what does the class differentiation indicate I how think many, how many it's lives lost on the trip. It's yeah, yeah, it's either that or the velocity of your ejection um, from the raft <laughs> upon, <laughs> upon hitting uh, boulders and uh, and or subterfuge. Yeah. Um, Politico just published uh, this article about it's kind of a build on the really big one, uh, which was uh, a New Yorker article back in 2015, basically the New Yorker publishes this huge article about the Cascadia Fault right after we moved to Portland. Um, we're like, Perfect. hey, that's a nice welcome gift. Uh, and so Politico just sort of built on that, visiting uh, a Coast Guard base on the coast uh, uh, of the border between Washington and Canada to see how they, you know, how they, would you go, if you, if you were Coast Guard and had ships that might be useful after a tsunami, maybe, would you race to the ships and race out to open waters or would you screw the ships and like run to get uphill? Yeah. No, I saw that article. It's pretty fascinating. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, the 60 foot high tsunami, who doesn't want to surf that, huh? People go to Mavericks every day to do that. That's true. That's true. Mika, good to see you, though we can't see you yet. And he may be on a different call or something. I, I do not know, but he's sort of here. Um, he, he put his jacket on the seat. <laughs> yeah, that could be it. Um, Santos had to turn himself. I did not. I, I knew that Santos was in trouble. Mika's having trouble connecting. Um, <clears throat> I knew that Santos was in trouble. I did not know he had to turn himself in and. Do the he whole arrest thing. He He's was arrested. actually arrested. And wire fraud and a bunch of other things could be 20 years plus. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh darn. But but at least but, he's got all those fashion uh quality clothes that he bought with campaign funds. So well, you yeah. know, he's got that going for him. Exactly. I was I was sort of fascinated, uh, morbidly fascinated by the the Santos thing because it seemed to me like he was pushing that envelope of, hey, look, you can become a powerful politician on nothing but lies. Right. And it's and it still works. And watch me do this. And he was sort of stepping into the limelight as a hero of a lot of people who were in the post-truth fake news world, thinking, well, good, that's the way we're just going to run things from now on. And if he actually serves time, that might put a little damper on that energy, which I would like. Well, and sure. then and then you have um, Trump's verdict that came down as this yep. week as well. I, which seems to me to be sort of toothless. Um, if, if if it doesn't put him in prison, he can. He, well, no, it's, he it's lied true. to his followers and basically collected a whole bunch of money, which, by the way, should be another legal case brought to him for misuse of funds, right? But he has money to pay her off with. Well, bear in mind that this is a civil case, so the misuse of funds would be a criminal case, and so right. that would be. Uh, handled differently. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's toothless because it will for it will be there forever. Right. Um, and and he's appearing on CNN Live tomorrow. 
That's tonight. right. No, it's tonight. Wednesday. Thursday. Wednesday tonight. Yeah. Town, town yeah. hall is tonight. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. and and I, I, if they don't ask him really hard questions about this, I don't know what happens. Yeah. And he, there's also <laughs> like book being made on whether he's even going to show up. Susan, well, yay! I love the rationale as to why he was not. Uh, they did not charge him or did not um, penalize him for rape and and not just sexual assault. Right. Or right. rather than just sexual assault. And that's because he they she couldn't tell whether he had, he had stuck his penis in her or not. Oh, Jesus. Right. right. Crazy stuff. And, and yep. So so I'm I remain amazed and shocked that the bulk of the Republican Party seems to think it's okay to put their eggs in the basket of a guy who has five, six active legal cases against him, any one of which would be devastating. And and like eh, document misappropriation that, you know, the Nara Lago case less interesting. The overstating your income case that they sort of already closed. Eh, those those are to me the the not less interesting ones, um, but but there's some like hugely substantial ones that uh, that are still those shoes are waiting to drop. Yay, Mika made it safely onto the onto the call. Very unsafely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do not look down. I I'm currently on the Whitestone Bridge. Oh no. Nice. It's a nice view out there. Sure. Um, <laughs> sorry, I, I'm. The, it's less than optimum. I'm. I'm on my way to take my mom to an eye doctor appointment. Uh, life. Life has its way of getting in the way. Mm. Doesn't it? Life finds yeah. a way to get in the way. <laughs> life, life finds a way. So I. I can be on for till like about twelve forty-five, and mm -hmm. was planning mostly to listen i i want more chat gpt talk <laughs> <laughs> oh we but can do that I, happy to talk about politics if you want i you know whatever uh, <laughs> but I'm gonna, I'm gonna put the phone down so you, you <clears throat> sorry you, you i don't really have a good way to both hold the phone and hold the steering wheel okay that is perfectly fine and we would rather not be witnesses to your okay. plunging, plunging yes. off the bridge in, in uh, a, no. as a live stream that's not good yeah um not, Susan not her head. It could be good for my views though. yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you said gp chat gpt susan threw her hand up so you're susan you're muted but please jump in hard to jump in when you're muted yeah yeah uh, well <clears throat> i was part of a, a conversation group yesterday uh a new one for me and so uh i just listened and um and what struck me about the whole, and it was a lot about chat GPT stuff. And I've been thinking this morning, which is one reason I'm a bit late to the call is because I was thinking when I'm thinking, I don't move as fast. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> partly as a reaction to what I've been hearing people talk about, which is over and over again, um, and they, they noted that mostly it was sort of in feelings mode, amygdalic is what I call it, uh, and, and reaction, binary mode, and all the rest of it. Um, but I got to thinking about it, and uh, I, I, I'm on the verge of proposing a project, but I don't want to go so far as to say it's a project. Um, it occurs to me that, given a, as a sort of student of conversation, and a student of, of um, organizational change and having spent time in the knowledge management world and all the rest of that, I got to thinking about <clears throat> the paucity of, or the, the paucity of options that have been mentioned, at least in my experience, or I've read about uh, for intervention. And uh, there, it starts with, you know, regulations being just about the only thing people talk about. And we know, on this group it knows, has enough experience to know that that's problematic. Um, and, and, the, and the best case, in a particular case, is chat these, these different things. So I was wondering whether uh, I thought about when I get into a new topic or a new area or a new something, I sometimes just start making lists. <laughs> and the list I was thinking of making was intervention points. 
Mm -hmm. uh, where in the process, where in an actual activity, where in the interaction, and that's where I would like to really focus, because we don't focus enough on making the interaction the center of our analysis, which I think we could do in ways that we couldn't before, um, and making a list. And so uh, just to see what people know and come up with on um, on a sort of a system who kind of thinking. And this group does a lot of that. So uh, I don't know if today is the right day, but um, I'm going to start a list and see where I get and, you know, take people's names and what they suggest and why they suggested it and see if uh, among us and always try to do this in a group, not individually, um, so that you get you get the sort of begin to get the mix of perspectives, uh, which is so valuable here. And uh, so anyway, I'm not saying we should do that today, uh, but I want to plant a seed. Um, and if we want to come back to it, if somebody thinks of something in the middle of the conversation, I'd be happy to hear it. I'm thinking of things as broad as uh, the sort of OGM -E donut economics thinking <laughs> and that framework, because there's a framework around intervention. So there are both frameworks and terms uh, that I just want to start collecting like I used to collect rocks. Um, and, oh, this is interesting, huh? And and uh, and just try to be a little more rigorous <laughs> about all of this. I'm sure there must be other people who have have worked on this and thought about it. And I I'm, I see the glimmerings of people who might might be thinking about in these terms. So anyway, I just wanted to put it out there and say, you know, we're in the process, we're in the practice, we're in the uh, we're in uh, you know who who are the what are the interactions we would like to look at, for instance? But at first, we could just do, you know, frameworks and ideas. I mean, I've heard people say, "Well, can't we can't we require uh, uh, can't we require people, uh, the regulators, to um, <clears throat> can't we ask the regulators to stop certain kinds of activity?" And that's just about the only one that people can get their heads around, who are not schooled in in this sort mm. of thing. Uh, so I'm just opening the invitation to that. And, and as we go through, if we get back to GPT, which I've now introduced and I know we're all sick of it, but, uh, I think, I think the, the time to be a little more rigorous about what can be done about it is, is way past. So I'm just putting that out there. Thanks, Susan. Anybody else jump in? I've got stuff I want to add, but I'd rather hear from everybody else. You might have to think about it for a while. I, I certainly have, and it's not easy. Well, this is going to sound like I'm being uh, I'm being a smart ass, but it's actually I'm actually serious about this. Power courts. Um, mm -hmm. One thing to remember about all of these these systems is that they run on electricity, and so mm -hmm. it's very hard for me to imagine a future where we are dominated by computers where we can't just pull the plug, and, and that may be oversimplifying but at the same time it's something that we tend to forget Be because we start to personify the ai um we start thinking of it as an independent actor in the way that a person is an independent yeah. actor and we we sometimes forget that these are as currently as as they are currently formed these are physical machines that require external power, whether via via battery or a plug in the wall. Uh, so, could we separate the? Ahead, Jimmy, could could you separate the uh, the question into two halves? Because it seems to me there's the the near term use of these tools by the commanding heights of capital, corporate, you know, all that, which is. The likely, you know, it's what Ted Chang writes about in the New Yorker this week. Uh, you know, this is McKinsey on steroids. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And in that case, <laughs> that have all, the electrical, all the electrical power they need. Um, there's the other case, which is more in the realm of maybe still science fiction of these things gaining enough capacity that they can, in effect, 
commandeer their own power or, you know, put that one to the side, maybe. I All mean, right. You know, All right. I mean, they're both. Well, we don't have to decide that. I'm collecting. Yeah. I'm collecting here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I have started well, another list, though, that, that prompts another list, if you don't mind, which is, uh, you know, uh, trying to subcategorize things before we're ready. Hmm. You know, okay. I would like to just get some, you know, in, in, in my own experience, I mean, one time when I was trying to sort out conversations, I just pulled every book, linguistics book or anthropology book or anything else I had on conversation off the, off the, and just looked through all of their indexes and got all the terms that is, are used in that kind of analysis. Well, you know, quite a lot. Uh, and then I didn't, I didn't want to just break it down right away. I wanted to just kind of marinate in it. So I'm going to let it make lists <laughs> but i'm going to put down a list uh, of things that are um are potential uh potential dividing lines or ways to to frame the problem that are kind of frame it so that it gets a little more together and i'm just i'm thinking it might be too early to do that but thank you i've got it down here and, and i i do recognize and and accept what you're saying wait mika I think it's so, really interesting, though, because think of all that information that's in, that's being flowing around in those wires or the air, actually. Okay. I mean, when you when you get down to the point where, you know, they can read. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know what to call this, but when they can actually get to the word level by sensing, you know, uh, re reading minds, reading brains, whatever brainwaves. Uh, you, you, you saw that. Things. Pardon? You saw you saw that article too. Then I did about the, I, uh, about generative AI being used to in, interpret um, brain signals to basically describe what someone is thinking about. Right. No, I didn't and, see that. Well, it's it's scary. <laughs> I mean, it's it's profound. I mean, it's just another <clears> thing we need keep on our minds but i'm just putting it down here interpreting brain signals uh so brain signals is 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 that an intervention point well we'll have to get around to that but you know i think you can see where the conversations are going i just Hello. interrupted no 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 someone who was going to say something several different thoughts one on the power plug um if this were blockchain, I'd be like, wow, that would be a good way. Just let's just deny it electricity. Let's cut off the feedstocks. Right. The, thing, the thing with these models is training them takes a bunch of energy, but not nearly as much as the ongoing calculations of blockchain distributed across the world. But once they're trained, there's basically an image of a set of neurons and weights and other funny things that can just be flashed onto a chip and you can run questions against it at almost no power. You could put this in a, in a Casio calculator and ask it questions, and it would be able to answer you just fine with a nine volt battery for, mm -hmm. a, for a long time. So you can't actually, I, I, I don't think you can deny this thing enough power to, to dent the, the capacity to, to just be present, right? To be well, not with that attitude. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, look, we, but that's not, the question is, I guess the question on the table is bringing up PowerPoints, and I know you're serious is that is a point that is a a point you know is it a point to intervene in mm -hmm. could it be a place to either gain some information or to whatever i mean that's the kind of question so we, we want to just keep it open for a while so after the cord cutters could there be cord pullers mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah uh um can we teach them to Pull and sell. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> pull our own cords. Well, that is actually a really that leads to a really interesting point. Mm -hmm. One of the po the potential points of intervention is um, competing systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. whether you think of it as competition or conflict, um, or rivalry or whatever. You know, are you talking about um, God, what was the name? Colossus, the Forbin project, and its count Soviet counterpart, Guardian. Do you remember that movie from the 1960s? Mm -hmm. No. Uh, sure. Yeah. In the in was... the 1960s, I wasn't allowed to go to movies, but okay. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> well, that raises a whole bunch of other questions. Is this yeah, a, right. the Forbidden, this is the why Forbidden I'm Project so... movie? The what? Forbidden Project. Yeah, 1970 is the movie. Oh, 70. Link to it. Oh, okay. I should have seen it then. 1970? No, I was out of the country. Okay. <laughs> That's it. Blame Global Travels for this. I am. That's okay, it. anything. So what was um, the name of it again? I didn't catch that. I just put it in the chat. Okay. Good. Well, now hey, Kevin. Project chats, talk. Hey. Nuts. Okay, go ahead. That's um, go ahead. No, I was going to say that, that one of the ways in which we could, if we are envisioning that these systems remain um, available and continue to proliferate, and they are powerful, one of the more um, effective ways of countering a, a generative AI system being used um, poorly may be to use a generative AI system to uh, seek out responses or to develop responses. Yes. Yes, a meta system of sorts. So to ask it, so how would you contain yourself? Well, uh, it's funny because I, I know, but that seems that it's rational. Yeah. Um, which actually leads to a point that something I've been mulling for the last few weeks that, you know, chat GPT easily passes the Turing test. You know, the, these generative AI large language models easily pass what we had been the um, agreed upon model for how to determine whether something is, is intelligent. <laughs> At least the, the pop, at least the popularly agreed upon model of determining whether a machine is intelligent. Um, but it may. But one thing that has always stuck with me is this definition of intelligence as being um, uh, being able to figure out what to do when you don't know what to do. Okay, and one of the things about right. large language models is they are they are limited in how they can respond to what they have been built on the the length the um models any of the inputs to their to their data we have been able to get to go around restriction or people have been able to go around restrictions in chat gpt and, and other uh, large language models um that have been that have been hard coded into them like you can't talk you can't talk about assassinating the president um by you know basically coming up with clever wording to work your way around the hard co coded rules mm -hmm. but the the way they work if you take a look at the text being used to work their way around the hard coded rules it's really obvious to a human mind what they're doing it's really obvious that they're trying to evade the restrictions the language or the, the letter of the law and it struck me that maybe one of the ways, that, one of the determining factors for whether or not a a, uh, a generative AI can be considered can be considered sentient or sapient is whether it can recognize when it, when someone is attempting to fool it, and you know, and and not just simply because of hard coded rules, but being able to to um, well, grasp that the emotion. Those of us who can tell when the AI is fooling us that we're not sapient. Yeah. Right. Sorry. Well, no, I'm I, I'm not uh, essentially opposed to that argument. Um. <laughs> Go ahead, Kevin. I I think this is another example of teaching to the test. Mm. But, well, which know, which one is? Well, the earlier models of things was can it play chess? Can it play Go? Can it do it? You know, this is, can it, you know, mimic what we would consider to be sentience, okay? And it's doing a good job of mimicry. Is it actually sentient? No, it's it's an idiot savant, <laughs> okay? This uh, mimicry thing, I'm going to flag it, okay? Go ahead. Sue. Mimicry doesn't come up enough in the conversation, so continue, because, uh, just a footnote I want to stick in here to keep in mind is, and it was we were bordering on that is is what, uh, what people, uh, what we do, <laughs> or don't do 
uh, ourselves? Like, how do we unplug ourselves? How do we stop ourselves? How do we, you know, it's like, uh, yeah. Sorry. So, min, 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 yeah, go ahead, mimicry. Yeah, I'm just saying that I, in, in my humble opinion, since we know what the parameters are of the Turing test, right, that you can go ahead and ingest enough information to, you know, do learning to, you know, the system can pass the test, right? If, if you know what the parameters are, and we do know what the parameters are, um, you know, to be fully human, all right, to get to that, if, I think it's, it's more important to talk about, this is a new form of intelligence, right? It is, it is intelligence, all right? Um, but if you're talking about modeling something that's going to be rivaling humans, then it has to have all the perceptual capabilities that we have, which they don't, all right? Because one can drive, one can write, one can do something else, mm -hmm. right? And we have no model for the pre-imprinted stuff that's in our amygdala, right? And, you know, all of the things that are flight, fight or flight are not present in these systems at the moment because they're not modeled. So I'll stop, okay? Oh, okay, so that's on the limits of, okay, so do you have a point of intervention you'd like to suggest? Uh, I entered the conversation not knowing that that was the purpose of the discussion, so I do not. Okay. We'll come back to that. That was that was sort of how it started. Yeah. Susan had proposed that sort of early <laughs> conversation about about uh, generative AI, which is like, where would we intervene? Um, and we haven't gone back and talked about that very much. <clears throat> I did post a link to Danella Meadows' 12 places to intervene, points of leverage in a system, which is the classic text on that. Um, it, it's really interesting how the Turing test seems to be the only test that people are coming up with or figuring stuff out about, about generative AI. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have good measures. We don't have a, a other good things going. Um, New and existing customers can... That's Sorry. hilarious. That's all right. Um, and then another thing I wanted to point to was uh, several people kind of at the fringes of the conversation pointed to a, a 1975 conference at Asilomar when recombinant DNA was just coming up and a bunch of researchers got together and said, hey, this stuff could be really dangerous. We should self-regulate. And they came up with a declaration of principles mm -hmm. uh, for how to go about researching this relatively dangerous technology, which is interesting. So, so some people are saying uh, we should have, uh, I don't think they've raised the Macy conferences, but, uh, but, it, but I, one of our network friends, Paul Pangaro, has wanted to, revital, to re, you know, revitalize the, the Macy conferences again. And the Macy conferences were, ironically, where artificial intelligence sort of was coined as such and where uh, some of the earliest, earliest researchers in <clears throat> emulating human reasoning or how the brain works uh, met. Um, so there, there, there's, there's even some precedent there for how this all went. Uh, the, 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 is this just a new McKinsey thing? Uh, Mika, I put the, the link to that article in the chat as well, is, is really interesting because partly um, there's a lot of promising technologies that show up, like the stuff we now call social media. And the thing that usually warps them and sends them down the wrong path is the capitalist medium they're born into. So uh, the major social media platforms all have as their business model, dumpster diving yep. our data, manipulating it to make us buy shit we don't want, basically espionage plus manipulation plus a whole series of other breaches of trust uh, plus addiction. And, and we seem to think it's okay that that's happening and that the people who run these platforms, you know, Zuckerberg is the, the hopefully benevolent dictator of the world's largest country because Facebook still has more monthly average users than the populations of India plus China, <laughs> which is staggering. And he doesn't seem to think of it as a civilizational platform that might be useful for helping improve society. He seems to think of it as an awesome money mill and data extraction device. And maybe the way Google has thought of itself for years now as an, an emerging evolving AI itself, right? Now that he's lost some of the meta the metaverse religion, thank God, but, but, but too bad because what he's probably going to do is look back on all the data they've collected and everything they've got and say, hey, how do we push the model and to make more money, which is 
not an unreasonable assumption about how a lot of efforts around this technology will be used. So what's the panel's opinion of auto GPT? And are you guys familiar with that concept that arised on the horizon towards the end of April? Yeah, a little bit. So auto GPT, basically the thing about these large language models and AI in general, they're typically built to solve a point problem, mm -hmm. right? And they become super experts at that point problem. What auto GPT does is it allows you to task it to go figure something out and it recruits a bunch of point problem bots to ultimately solve something massively complex. <laughs> so as an it's example, a, it's a Marvin Minsky society of mind. So as an example, not only that, but it codes problem solving bots. So you know, the whole the whole axiom of when robots start building robots, we should be worried. What about software that writes software? Should we be worried? I don't yeah, know. It's prompting but, itself. Yes. But but the problem, the problem set that, that came out, I heard a case study on this and then I saw it. I, I can't find it, but I've got a couple different uh tech crunch articles that I could post into the chat here for us. Um I live in the valley and I want to take my three kids and my wife uh, for a weekend to go wine tasting. We have very specific wine tastes. Uh, two of my children have very specific diets and diet restrictions. Um, we are very fond of this type of food. Uh, we're very sensitive to these types of sheets. Um, we like to have outdoor picket picnics, but only if they're shaded areas. Um, we don't want to have to drive more than 90 minutes to any single destination. I want to be able to check in at 6 p.m. on Friday. I want to be able to leave Monday morning at 8 a.m. after a great, fantastic Eggs Benedict brunch that we had once at this French eatery. And I'd like to do all of this for the price point of $2,200 solve. And it doesn't. And you know what? This is in three and a half weeks. So if you can beat that price point for me by more than 8% rebook. Now, all these bots are going off. They're figuring out, you know, the long tail of nuances from all these different companies, all these different vendors, all these different bed and breakfasts. The weird thing is, is that it ruthlessly decides what qualifies as satisfaction to the task. So all the nuances of customer experience and loyalty and brand, I'll just toss it, just throw it away. doesn't matter anymore these bots are just going to execute with precision. Now, put this into an enterprise space. Um, I want to spin up a brand new company to help uh, do CRISPR at scale. Um, I've got a seed fund of $10 million. I'm only going to hire 15 coders, you know, a couple 1Xers, a couple 10Xers. But I want you to build a couple cloud spaces for us to do the software development and keep ruthlessly moving our data and changing our clouds based upon what our performance needs are and the best price point possible go. So now all the enterprise B2B loyalty stickiness, you know, those kind of old school, you know, contracts, you know, once you bought into Oracle, you're there for life. Well, screw that. You know what? I want you to dissect enterprise software and come up with a better way to do it at a cheaper price point. Go. So the thing that's got me up at night is a couple of things. The, the whole of customer experience, I think, could pivot in a heartbeat here. Number one. Number two, it's highly disruptive, which is always fun. Number three, the unintended consequence of these task bots going off and doing people's biddings. Number four. But then number five, the thing that haunted me, which made me want to come to talk to you fine people today, isn't this the beginning of the consumer vendor management customer vendor management beginning i could have a task bot that represents brad smith in all endeavors and i could task that task bot to go off and solve these particular things and it knows my preferences and it's only going to engage based upon what i've told it to do and i'll just stop here yeah. something that, that i believe kevin said a moment ago about teaching to the test um how how many weeks would it take before you start seeing advertising bots that are designed to interact specifically with these concierge uh, meta systems? Sure, I mean, basically designed to um, to game them. 
Sure. You know, hit yeah. the trigger words, hit the, you know, whatever the, you know, response time, whatever is the, are the qualifiers that underlie the code for determining what, is, what is the satisficing re, uh, result, uh, basically gaming to that, you know, it's, it's the, uh, white on white words to, to, uh, to game, uh, search engine op optimization. I would further say, Brad, that um, it wouldn't take too long to be able to message, you know, from say a Mandarin Oriental or Ritz Carlton or, you know, the top level brands to say, are you tired of the random shifts of experience that you're getting from your, you know, from your bot, okay? You should, you know, enjoy the end-to-end -end experience that we're going to give you, all right, if you just, you know, stay with us globally, yeah. right? We will, you know, we will cater to your needs, okay? We will know you, all right, in a way that no bot, you know, can... That's right. Inside. We're human We person. actually use the technology inside yeah. the bubble of our own experience, and you're going to love it, all right? That yeah. would actually, you know, um, you know, potentially be the walled garden, you know, mm -hmm. that people would say, oh, I want to be part of that, all right? And, you know, other people won't, all right? The, the, they'll want the herky-jerky, you know, um, you know, give me the best deal, you know, of the day. But there will still be a role to play for, you know, brands that, um, you know, deliver something and can deliver on their promise. Go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, two quick thoughts. Um, one, I'll see your Mandarin Oriental bot and raise you a Four Seasons bot. <laughs> um, sure. In 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 the sense of, um, I think what you were proposing was a bot that would manage your experience so that you always want to stay at, at Mandarin Oriental properties, which is interesting. Yeah, not total mm -hmm. landscaping, Jimmy. That is a much higher value property. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but what I mean is, there are people who go to Four Seasons because Four Seasons has for years been famous for keeping track of their preferences and customizing its stay. But 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 imagine your whole world, including your home being managed as if it were a Four Seasons experience and that the mm -hmm. bot isn't managing your time on property and trying to lure you to stay at the property, but it's buying you sheets for your house. It's treating you with, it's got a butler service that takes over your Google Assistant or whatever else mm -hmm. it is that you're using. It basically curates your entire life as if you were always walking around in a Four Seasons property. And that's really kind of overwhelming and interesting. I, yeah. I think that's that's true. And the fact is, you know, the big difference between a Four Seasons and a Ritz-Carlton is if you blindfold somebody and say, where are you at, at a Ritz-Carlton? Is you say, I'm at a Ritz-Carlton. I have nowhere, I, I don't know where I am on the planet, but I'm at a Ritz-Carlton, right? Because they have a high consistency level. Four Seasons is very localized, right? So if you're in Singapore or you're in Miami or you're in Chicago, you know, right, that, you know, there are overtones, I'm out of Four Seasons, but you also know you're in Chicago, right? Right. Because it's bringing in the local experience. They want you to know, you know, where you are on that, you know, dimension. So what kind of experience do you want curated for you is also something that you're buying into and deciding, right? Mm -hmm. um, Brad, to your point is, could you build that into your prompt? Right. Maybe, right. right? But the fact is, that as you bounce around uh, and, you know, get this thing constantly being put together for you, it's not likely that you're going to get the end to end that Jerry's describing. Right. You will miss that. I think you're, I think you're spot on there. Um, the other classic task you could say is, um, I want you to find the top 100 prospect companies and I want you to market, build a marketing campaign for me to market these products. I also want you to find the names and contact information of the chief marketing officer at each one of these firms. I want you to write a sales pitch. I want you to send emails, manage responses, SMS text it, social media. I want to set up a bunch of meetings based upon uh, interactions with this. And uh, by the way, have it done by Wednesday. And here's like, my credit card. Do you want to say right. that? Right. Yeah. And 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 the thing of it is, is that I don't know what your guys' LinkedIn random pop in. Hey, I'm a friend. How you doing? Let's connect. You know, it's 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 there's no human anywhere out there right now, I don't think. 
Um, so that's already here. But, you know, the fact that somebody who has a great imagination and a tiny bit of tech savvy moxie can now release that kind of marketing force into the universe that typically was reserved for much, much bigger companies back in the day. Mm -hmm. You know, it there's a lot great. of small businesses out there and there's a lot of the, and, and the other thing is, is that the great shedding of uh, headcount balance sheets in technology, I think they're just, they're, you're going to see a wave of entrepreneurs coming out of all these tech layoffs that, you know, can put a couple building blocks together and they're up and running. So I think, I think the density of the marketing messages out there is going to get beyond chaotic. At, at a B2B level, um, I'm just going to say that, you know, the, the people who do this, who manage supply chains yeah. have been trying to prune the number of entities that they do business with so that they know whose throat to choke. Okay? Right. Now, whether those entities that they're doing business with, you know, will, you know, um, have the keretsus that will allow for the promiscuity that you want, uh, looks unlikely for a supply chain like automobile manufacturing. That seems highly unlikely to me. Um, for the kinds of service orientations that you have, maybe. Um, so I think it's going to be highly dependent on what part of the economic sector you're talking about that will allow this to manifest. Hmm. I'd like to mark a shift in the conversation and ask if it matters to anything we're talking about. No. So we've gone from, uh, uh, and that's not to say we shouldn't do this. I'm just, mm -hmm. uh, I just noticed a shift uh, between uh, sort of the chat PD, the chat, the what chat P, GPT kinds of things do now, and they're. Uh, and and they're mostly sort of you know giving you information it's kind of an information exchange or question and answer thing and and it's been going further and further into you know what we want what people want to have done for them okay now that's fine right and we should be aware of uh, but we should be aware of that shift because I think there's a, a big thing as and you can see that in some of the articles that are out there now that talking about uh, talking about where the you know where it is that well thinking that maybe these these kinds of system are now about to give us something really useful. And mm -hmm. often it's framed in these terms of what can it do for us, uh, which. Uh, You know, I mean, it's it's like, does the chat GPT need to have built in? Uh, uh, you can you can ask it directly, but d what about indirect speech acts? I mean, what about uh, mm. things that are more subtle? Mm. Uh, your intent becomes in this in this shift. Lots of things mm -hmm. come up as interesting as interesting things to figure out, like. You know, what's the intent behind the question? That's been an AI question for decades. Yeah. Yep. At what point will we do, will we design a system that can read between the lines? Yes, we do. There we go. <laughs> so in some strange way, that's what these systems are doing right this second, is that they're 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 being trained up to get a map of roughly what's going on, and they're busy interpolating and reading between the lines like crazy and using that to generate new text, et cetera, et cetera. It's interesting. I wanted to go back a little bit to Brad's scenario, which I vastly agree with uh, and is super interesting because one of the things I'm trying to figure out is how to get my brain into the, oh, I need to attach these superpowers to my fingertips and extend my capacity like crazy by setting these things up to go do things. And you said, I'd like you to have this all done by Wednesday. Uh, it could all be executed within the hour. Uh, there's, there's, yeah, there's, absolutely. Yeah. There's no, there's no reason, there's no reason to think about that as if you were tasking a human and thinking right. about human hours to do it, because this thing will just go execute on on each of the little steps that you wanted, and and the the pauses that you will want in the process are pauses so that the people you're trying to solicit. Um, won't think that it's a bot, will think, oh, it must be a human. So you'd be like, so wait a random amount of time before you send off the reply or the, pro or the probe or whatever, who knows. 
But I wanted to come back to just a little slice, which is one of the things that's held up e-commerce a lot over time and this idea that everything's going to wind up in markets and we're just going to be able to put out our bids and offers is that the moment those kinds of threats show up in the marketplace, all the people with offers are like, well, shit, I don't want my stuff being comparable to anybody else's anything. So they <laughs> hide the data, they make it incomparable by messing with the warranty terms, the what, whatever it is you can do to make it hard to compare your product with others is good because it hides, it hides you from the comparison engine and from being basically competed out of the market by the, the efficiency function you were proposing uh, yep. to come in. And I defy anybody to go to Comcast's website and figure out what actually Comcast service costs. Because yep. they, do their, they do their damnedest to only post special offers. And it's like the special offers ex expire after a couple of months, but they will not tell you what the actual going rate is for most of their services, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They, they, how they live behind this veil of obfuscation uh, forcing people to call them up and try to negotiate a better deal all the time, which is, seems to be part of their business model, which is lunacy for a company that has basically a duopoly, uh, or if not a monopoly on, on, on access in this country, thanks to our really stupid telecom policies. Um, I, that, that's where we are. Like that, That's mm -hmm. kind of the marketplace we've, we've uh, helped create. Uh, but partly what I'm trying to say is there will be systems trying really hard to defeat being comparable in anything and and a system that's smart enough to sort its way through that and bully the vendors into divulging all that information would be super valuable actually mm -hmm. yeah i mean there's a big difference between being able to competitively bid for things that are comparable and competitive evaluations for things that are qualitatively different but are offering you something that in you know some field you want Right. And here we circle back to regulation. Yes. Regulation. Because yeah, I don't know if you saw, there's a bill that's just been put uh, in front of the California Assemb State Assembly that would um, formalize and regularize the language used on for expiration on cans for food products, whether it's, so no longer can it be best enjoyed by versus sell by. It's uh, It's either use by or um or use before or use but use by versus um best when used by so is it, is it something that you have to throw away at, at one point or is it something that will degrade over time uh at least the idea is to formalize that language to make mm -hmm. it clear um and so it's yeah and of course the the food anyway I mean, I'm sorry. It's probabilistic anyway. The stuff is is decaying at some rate. Yeah, but the fact in in terms of like pharmaceuticals, we probably should use language like destroy by. Right. Yeah. The the point though with, with the food is, is that so it, very often the the date on the can or on the box is for the retailers sell by, um, and that has that actually actually has nothing to do with the quality of and edibility of the food, it's entirely a marketing issue. And so the, the whole point of this of this regulation, this proposed regulation is to create um, a normalization of the language. And in a way, what you were just describing there is, how can we create a normalization of the ter these particular terms and concepts? You know, so you have to, you have to expose your price. Um, I think that's the case now for airlines in the U.S. They have to show you the actual final total and not yeah. add the whole, just, all the different things just, added on at the end. I think they just passed that. Yeah, I think that's a new. Yeah. Year. Hey, Dave. Hey, Dave. Yeah. We're we're on the we're on the pale blue marble. Do you find yourself today? Uh, Tacoma Park, Maryland. Oh, nice. Yeah. Looking for the, the the most liberal part of the DMV. So as a chef, you may, I, I like going to the grocery store and actually buying, there's a particular place I like to go, buying the meat that has been discounted because it has been aged right to the point that if I <laughs> buy it, right, as they've discounted it, if I use it within two or three days of that purchase, it's really good, right? Um, because you want the meat to be aged, right? And so... Uh, it's it's a good deal economically, and you know it's ready for me to do something with it. You wait just a little longer. It's salami. I mean, people kind of go, "Oh yeah," you know. If if you talk to a sushi chef, you never want to serve fish that is fresh. 
okay? You want to serve fish that has just gotten to the tipping point, all right, where it's very flavorful, but is not rotting in your mouth, okay? So it's a, a lot of times they, they get it to that point and then they freeze it, they flash freeze it and then retrieve it, right, to be able to serve it at that exact moment, right, when they want it in your mouth. Go ahead, Jerry. Can I just vouch for frozen foods? Like, like mm. um, there's a whole industry for freezing veggies and meats and mm -hmm. fish and stuff like that that lets it lets you like go defrost something on demand and it's better than the thing you thought you were buying fresh that was wrapped in paper that's been exposed to air and and warm, 100%. you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's like exactly. Hmm. Yeah. So, I just bought a freezer for that very reason. Oh, really? Nice. Like like a Foot Locker style freezer or a standard? No, freezer? no, no. I it took me a long time to figure. I didn't want one of those because I lived with one of those growing up, and you just you know about the fifth layer in, you just sort of like your hands are freezing. Yeah, yeah. If if you want to do what you're talking about, Jerry, right at the top level uh, is the Japanese chefs use medical grade flash freezers to do this work. All right. So I need I need a liquid nitrogen. I need a. It's it's not quite that cold. <laughs> Okay. Okay. <laughs> but it's but it's pretty cold, right? Well, it's it's colder than a regular refrigerator. The technology I mean, that, that Lawrence Clarence Birdseye, I think, pioneered the technology that gets us this bag of peas where the peas aren't all stuck together in a clump because they're dropped through something and frozen on their way down through the fall, so they're individually flash frozen, um, yeah. and that was that was a really big advance back in the day. Hundred percent. Like Morton salt, right? That the reason that the little girl has the umbrella is salt used to clump. Yep. All right. And now it gets humid and so on and so forth, but Morton salt is still granular. So it's worth the extra nickel that you pay, right, for for that feature. I have a note here from an article way back when frozen fish has half the environmental impact of fresh. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. Including the refrigeration from point. I mean, I know that a lot of the commercial fishery boats now freeze the fish right on the boat. Yeah. Yes. In fact, if you want good scallops, you want dry dry scallops is what they're called. Yeah. Yeah. It's good stuff. Yeah. Um, I have so this start... last mile problem with frozen things. Oh. Just getting them home in time. <laughs> well, you have a three have you have a three mile drive down curvy roads to get to your place, so yeah. Right. I mean, not just that. It's, it's the the six mile curvy road on the way up, yeah. but you know that's just. But I think but it's also the, true of people going shopping that um, if you really want to keep that and you're you're you have control over everything except you know. But if you're trying to pick up your kids and you're trying to go to the grocery store and you're trying to, yeah. It's it's the next feature for an electric vehicle is the you know freezer chest oh, in the back. Right. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I actually used to have an ice chest that you could plug into the uh into the uh the cigarette lighter. And uh if you put cold stuff in there, it would it would more or less keep it cold. Ice cream. I, I don't know <clears throat> ice cream home. But I'm, I'm thinking of other people, all these long commutes, right? And people who, who, you know, kids still go to school and all the rest of it. I think that's a great idea. Maybe we should just go into business. Although somebody's probably already figured this out. Um, I'm going to put a link to frozen foods in the chat for Jamey. And it looks like it was Clarence who did the flash freezing. But I was no, no, I, I know. I was making a joke about it. ho, ho, ho. Ah, <laughs> what is, was it actually? The green, the green giant that did it. So, what does this leave us on GPT and uh, generative AI? My guess it wasn't peas; it was berries. <laughs> Entirely possible. Sorry, that's okay. Um, what so one one opinion we haven't voiced out loud, but I think we share here is that the horse is out of the barn. Yeah. Uh, that that any 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 motion to sort of uh, suppress research for six months or do a big pause or do whatever else yeah. like not really. Uh, and I posted no. a link to the memo that Google the internal Google memo that came out that said, "Oops, we have no moat. OpenAI has no moat." 
the open source stuff is going to race past yeah, us. That's that. Yes. That's the whole point is that open source is doing a really good job. Yeah. You know, Bakuna is, you know, moving by leaps and bounds on its own. All right. <clears throat> what was the Stanford, you know, piece that they basically, you know, took the model and stood up something that was GPT like, you know, in 48 hours. Yeah. So you know, you're, you're not yeah. going to put this genie back in the bottle. Mm -hmm. But nobody's, that, that's where the regulation question comes in. I mean, who's, who's thinking beyond, <laughs> you know, instead of just stopping it. And I mean, regulation is, is always post, I mean, has been traditionally before grand to get around to it. It's a long time before regulation actually happens because it's a social process. And a lot of the people who do it don't understand regulation, but they don't understand, you know, what you're regulating and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I mean, look, it's been, here's the, here's the, the point. It's only been trained on what's available and can be scraped on the World Wide Web, which represents less than 10% of human knowledge. All right. So, you know, the, the other goodies that it needs to know um, are behind paywalls and firewalls and are in skips. <clears throat> so, it's it's not smart enough, right, to outsmart all the, to do all the things that you know we need done because it hasn't been trained on it yet. Do we know that it hasn't made its way to the Internet Archive or Google Books or other places that have gotten behind some of those things like DRM that protects books? Because I have a funny feeling that the large library of books is actually in the training set, well, but, I don't, yeah, but I don't know. I'm sure it is. So that what would that add? Two percent. Um, yeah, but it's an important percent. I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying that, you know, the, well, um, yeah, there's, there's, well, another thought, there's another thought here real quick. Also mm -hmm. that indigenous ways of knowing are important. We've talked about them a couple of times on our calls and many of them are not representable in the kinds of things that we're talking yeah. about. And many, 100%. many indigenous, uh, ways of knowing are tied to the land and the language kind of inextricably. So when people get pushed off their land, it destroys some of the knowledge. And when their languages are lost, that that sort of craters them in many ways. Uh, but, so there's, but there's even a representational question about whether that kind of knowledge is amenable to being represented in these kinds of models. Well, so two things uh, in to think about in response to both of you. One is that you know, what happens when they do start to try to represent uh, indigenous ways, indigenous knowledge with these systems, is there a is there a potential way of in, of interpreting the indigenous ways of knowledge into a uh, LLM readable format? Uh, the other, and this is more response to, to Kevin, is that there's actually the problem right now is the loss of quality or is the limited number, amount of quality material for large language models. The, from what I was reading, it, is that the most of what's used for uh, LLMs is not just the majority of stuff on the web. It's a fairly limited amount of material from high quality edited uh, journals and uh, newspapers, places that where the writing is decent, the places where the knowledge is more or less trustable. Um, and one of the concerns that a number of them, a number of the groups have is that will they start to have to expand out to lower quality stuff just to keep feeding the beast the, the responsibility of what to put in the hopper wow yeah exactly but you you do have like if you go into gpt playground you know that has a lot more controls available to you is you can select you know do i want davinci 3 or do i want something you know down in the list that is better at coding so you can select you know what do I want, you know, which knowledge base do I want to work with, all right? Which one do I want to train on? And you you have to have some literacy about generative AI to be able to make those choices. You say, well, what's in DaVinci 3, right? Um, you know, do I actually have a taxonomy that's accessible that can tell me what was that trained on? I think mm -hmm. that we need to be able to have, where's the pop-up bubble that shows me, oh, that's what's in this thing. We don't but here's really. A, here, oh. Go ahead. Yeah, here's a here's a thought to go back to this this mimicry. I've been musing about this and reading about. Um, uh, you know, we we well goes back to my you know whatever. Never mind. Try to keep this simple. The um, 
or clear. <laughs> the, uh, the business of mimicry, I mean, children learn language by mimicry, and now we're learning, they're learning a lot of things by mimicry, and it turns out that doesn't stop. Adults learn, thing by, learn things by mimicry. Uh, we, we sit, I mean, and we also do things by mimicry. I mean, the, 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 the cliches are things like sitting around a conference table. And if somebody, if it's a fairly cohesive group and somebody starts to lean on their, on their elbows, then, you know, soon everybody's leaning on their elbows. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. or crossing their legs or mm -hmm. any of these kinds of things. And I'm thinking, if you think about indigenous, uh, well, you know, if you think about indigenous say work I'm, I'm a big fan of work <laughs> understanding work how work happens and 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 the way, the way we've only ever been made been able to make real progress uh in understanding work is by some very very tedious uh, uh anthropological data collection but then there's interpretation and i think interpretation is something we need to teach uh or get keep kids to learn we, we you know what is interpretive work and you now find you now find people talking about interpretive work uh, and 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 who who's you know uh, it becomes it becomes very interesting to, to see what that kind of work is and it's it's largely hard hard to see it's like analysis it's like you know when I was working with lots of anthropologists and I, I loved their insights I loved what they were coming up with the question was what does it mean for anybody mm -hmm. and in particular who and who's going to decide and all of those big questions um so interpretive work is you find that term now you know you can you can start to find find things around it but we don't we don't spend a lot of time thinking about how to you know are, are we expecting this these ais to do and no, they don't at the moment they're not doing analysis uh and they're not yeah uh, There's yeah. an interesting question coming up in the tools for thinking space. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. There's an interesting question coming up in the tools for thinking space of, well, maybe now that we have ChatGPT, we don't need to take notes anymore. Oof. Because everything's just going to go into the search bin and we'll be able to ask the system, hey, tell me what this is, what this was, what happened, whatever. And I'm like, oh my God, that sounds so dangerous. Um, yeah. and, and a piece of what I'm trying to figure out is how do we continue our activities and reach out to blend and mesh with these yes, new intelligences yes. in really productive yeah. ways, but not how do we just, oh, good, I don't need to. It's, it's a little bit like uh, the, uh, my normal narrative before GPT was we outsourced our memories to Google and Wikipedia, and that was a mistake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Kevin. I, I was just um, <clears throat> working on a soft skills um, and uh, project and the people are putting together we're, we're talking about you know the role of note taking right and I said look in fifth grade I had a very forward thinking teacher who um, made us put down on index cards one word or short phrase all right that represented the story or the you know the lesson that we just heard she'd collect them from us with our name on it and a month later, she would hand them back and say, tell me what that story was, right? And so the only prompt that we had, we didn't have notes, we had the word or the phrase, right? And we were, you know, it's kind of like, okay, neurons, go pull that back out. That <coughs> has turned out to be a miraculous gift, you hmm. know, for, for me to be able to take notes that are relatively cryptic, but pull back entire narratives right or ideas um and it was it was training it was like you know go ahead compress it compress <clears throat> it compress it okay now what what's the you know how do you trigger retrieving it and you know that and speed reading which by the way i had to control later right because <laughs> speed reading is antithetical to proofreading all right um so you, you have to i have to turn that off and slow down but great gifts right and i wish uh, as as we're moving through this we have to have our index cards we still have to write down and commit to memory what we want to what we think is important because all the prompt engineering and all the prompt crafting is based on knowing enough to know what to ask right and mm -hmm. 
you know, if we if, if we're a dictionary of, problem, right? Yeah. Well, if if we didn't <laughs> remember spell anything, it. then we have no yeah. frame to ask a better question. And I think that the people who are going to win in this are augmented by these systems, by the vast knowledge that they have, but that you yourself have a framework of knowledge, right? That allows you to allows you to ask a better question, right? Versus the other human being. So. Well, I'd love to, to push, I mean, it just takes, take the conversation back three steps again, but the but this mm -hmm. notion, Kevin, of who's going to win, right, is the, is the part that worries me a little bit. And it's like, you know, is, the, is it a winner-take-all game? And, and that no, to I'm me- not, just, I didn't mean to put it in winner lane. No, no, I know, no, no. But I mean, but that, that's what I was just taking the question back to that governance issue around the AIs. And, and what do we do? I mean, I feel like in some sense, the technology has created a new set of problems around governance of large scale infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't have an answer to that yet. And it seems to me the notion that it's going to be government, right? Our traditional government doing this, maybe, maybe not. They don't seem to be all that good at managing this kind of infrastructure. You know, do we really want to re replicate the highway departments in all the states? I don't, I don't think so. You know, we need a different mod modality. And I'm kind of curious. The only one I can think of is the Linux Foundation, and this. And I would love to know if, if anybody knows how the Linux Foundation does decision making. Um, but okay, anyway, but I mean, does, they're managing. How it does they're, what? They're the, by far the largest, you know, archive of tech assets I think in the world. And I, I saw some stuff about their growth rate recently, and it's tremendous. They're managing five, six hundred projects. I mean, they're. They're getting a couple million lines of code a day, you know, and they're, you know, that stuff underpins so much of what we do, you know, and they, I don't know, they're spending a hundred million dollars themselves. I don't know how much is being contributed, probably 10 times that, a hundred times that. Um, so anyway, we don't, there are governance, there are governance structure for that chunk of asset, but I don't know how it works. Uh. I know somebody who might know. <laughs> I guess I feel like, you know, like when we're looking for models of how do you govern AI, we should look at London Linux Foundation. I mean, OpenAI had some weird structure right around your investment and return on your investment and things like that too, right? But I don't know how that works either. You know, I mean, we're playing, we're experimenting in the space, but I don't know what we've learned. I, and I'd love to know what we learned. Mm -hmm. th this, is, this is my um, uh, line, okay, for, you know, this stuff is when, these systems start to collaborate with the um, the AI that's already installed that's you know a hundred meters away from the New York Stock Exchange, right? And they secretly buy up the utilities and start to tell me how much electricity I can have every day because the AIs want more of my electricity than the human beings get. That's <laughs> when I know that you know, uh, you know we, we have a problem. Right. That's what we've lost. Electricity is, is being uh, redirected. Isn't that probably happening? Uh, say more. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, when, we already know when, it's going toward, uh, you know, crypto mining. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, crypto mining aside, I think. I mean, there are issues around crypto mining, right? I mean, there are places that have put restrictions on how much power people can have to do that and, you know, seeking ways to, to get more. But I think in terms of like municipal uh, municipalities or people who are supposed to be governing electricity, um, it's like water only, uh, well, water's worse, but it's like that. <laughs> um, it's a finite resource that, it, it, you know, we're gonna just sort of need more and more and more of. I think right now we're in about a 2% range of total global electricity being used for data centers. 2%? All right. Yeah. Doesn't sound much, that, but it, <clears throat> on a local but, but level. I, I think, <laughs> yeah, but I, but I think what's going to happen is the algorithms that generate chat technologies uh, are fairly rudimentary. You know, there's not a lot of differentiation. There's not going to be some sort of magic sauce. It's about the data that it learns from. So I think um, a huge propagation of walled gardens is about to happen. 
and a lot of shutting down of open indexing is about to happen so that my secret sauce is my proprietary data and my mm -hmm. proprietary insights and that's you know my chat tool is better than their chat tool because blank and so i see a huge propagation of um that happening and then a bunch of you know, experimental data sets so well let's go let's go train on this data set and see if there's anything there there so Imagine I'm running 250 training exercises with massive quantities of data just to see which one of these things is going to produce a winner. So I see I see a huge growth in data center and data center use in cloud storage, as well as potentially on prem because you don't trust the cloud not to not to see what you're doing. Um, so you're going to have a, a a corollary to that is that as those proprietary ones spin up, they'll see the edge cases of wanting to create the new Karatsus and Kaiballs, right? To have yeah. collectives start to form that share data, right? And, you know, that's going to be versus, you know, their competitive Karatsus and Kaiballs. Yeah, I like Look that. Look at all those intervention points. <clears throat> As you, that's right. That, that's the right one. Uh, yeah. No, I was just doing a pun with AI, Kaiballs. Yeah, as you were talking about what just reminded me, my wife works at the UC Berkeley Biosciences Library. Um, and one thing that the entire University of California system, library system is doing is digitizing everything. Mm -hmm. Every single work that that is they have in in stock, essentially, old or new, is being digitized and made available within the university library system to students and to researchers. And it just struck me that, you know, perhaps, and I'm, I'm sure that UC is not the only place that's doing that. And, and it struck me that perhaps one of the um, walled gardens, walled garden models that emerges is uh, from universities. This is the Oxford large language model that's based okay. entirely on all of the material that Oxford, that Oxford University has collected and its libraries, or well, this is the University of California system. Yeah, so we, we've done that for the North Carolina Community College system, which is a whole bunch of practicum like knowledge, right? About, you know, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill does not know how to repair air con large air conditioning systems, right? But, right, the community college system sure does. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's, you know, they, they have a differentiated, and we have 54 of those campuses in the United in, North Carolina, right? So it's a big knowledge base, very interesting. Uh, it's uh, it's more certificate type knowledge as opposed to degree type knowledge. So imagine that as as a GPT, 100%. or as or as a large language model. Hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's already being. It was already ingested <laughs> using machine learning system, so that instead of needing to meta tag going in it read it and auto meta tagged it as it read it okay mm. to create a hyperdimensional fingerprint for every object in the system so this raises uh it's not a i don't know question observation i guess uh thinking back to the xerox park work on technical tech reps and mm. knowledge management and the observation that there's a social quite a social uh, dynamic in approving or not approving what goes into those kinds of things. And so the, they had they had experiments or they had went out into the field to see how people were solving problems and it's all interesting reading and it's all very important. And But one thing that happened was that they decided to make a knowledge system for all of the technical knowledge, et cetera. And so they got a really good expert uh, one of the most, you know, an expert practitioner, to to uh, classify the the value of the of the of the information that was being recorded. And uh, the thing is that within the tech rep community, uh, well, first of all, they didn't use it. They were supposed to, and they didn't. Uh, and when when you sort of looked at it more deeply, then it turned out that, you know, you could find that that the the groups of tech reps that work together you know this whole community of practice thing right is they 
when they put somebody they trusted in in place to approve what's going into the data store um then uh uh usage went up i mean by an enormous percent and i think i think we're i mean things i worry about are the thing that we've abandoned any any sense of how in fact you know this isn't knowledge we're creating we're creating information and it goes from little i'll i'll send you a diagram at some point you know it kind of goes from through this process inside these different groups it has to be reinvented all the time the wheel has to be re-understood you know it's like all the things that you, as you get older and you realize oh my god we knew that you know 20 years ago 30 years ago how come these people don't know it well it's because it, there is this interpretive step in which understanding what was said and how and why and and that context has changed it has to be redone in that in that new context um and we're leaving all that out when we think that we're we're going to have quality data i was asking a question earlier about the data quality i mean who who's in charge of that and mm. what where what constitutes you know we've we've learned so much i mean if you go back to uh, oh come on jerry help me uh the french guy the french philosopher um Derrida, no. No, not uh, Derrida. That's the one that came to mind. Um, Derry Lewis. No. <laughs> that, that's, <Nice>. That'll do. <laughs> but, he actually is a French philosopher, if you think about it. Yes. He is? Well, I mean, okay. he was treated as one, kind of, by the French. Um, oh, sorry, see. you're looking for uh, Deleuze and Guattari? You're looking for... No, 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 no uh, just forget it, it. It'll come to me soon enough. But he wrote a book called, um, uh, you know, Laboratory Life. Um, huh. One of it, that was his thesis. You must have it in your brain. I do. Uh, you're talking about uh, Bruno Latour. Absolutely. Okay. So Bruno Latour wrote a book called um, Laboratory Life. That was his thesis. And that was the beginning of his whole, you know, evolution <laughs> to where he is now. Is he still alive? I guess. Uh, uh, no, died, died at 75 year. years old uh, in 2022. Correct. Okay, yeah. So uh, in that book, which I had the opportunity to dig deeply into with a pharmaceutical, it was a pharmaceutical lab and uh, with uh, a guy who was a pharmaceutical researcher in Switzerland, we read that book together and went through all that in, in, in ornate until the person who was funding it got brain cancer. So uh, we Anyway, we went through it and what was interesting, somewhere I have notes, so interesting to see how it was that the, that they, well, they all wanted to know how they were reinventing the same thing to aspirin over and over again, right? But in this case, it was, um, in this case, it was a really intricate uh, insight about how some molecules can, can interact or don't interact in the same way. And that was held by people who weren't in power. And that eventually that did win out, but it was, they, they sat on a, a mindset that was just wrong or not useful in, in the case that they were looking at. That happens so much and nobody's watching that. And I sort of think, you know, insight, intuition, all of these things, we can't let go of those. And just abdicate. <clears throat> so the Gen Zs and the Gen Alphas that are growing up with this technology, uh, my my oldest daughter is an adjunct professor teaching creative writing at University of North Florida, and um, you know people are submitting obviously essays that have been influenced or updated or modified or wholly created by this kind of technology. Yeah. Their sensitivity as to good enough, their sensitivity as to this feels wrong, it feels disingenuous, it doesn't have a real voice, like the, the subtleties and nuances of, you know, historic writing, great writing versus I, I got it done, it was good enough, you know, it looks fine. Yeah, I spackled the hole in the wall, but I haven't painted the wall because, you know, you don't really notice it. Like, that's the thing I'm, I'm fascinated about. 
as as I see this, right? Um, you know, I've got two sets of kids that are millennials. I've got a daughter who's 14, who's theoretically a Gen Z, and then two that are 13 that are theoretically alphas. If it comes from a trusted source, whatever it says, that's instructional and good enough to take action against. There's like no tenacious life experiences that have built a, a wise model of what's actionable and what's not. And what should I believe and what should I use and what what should I allow to represent me and my thinking and my thought processes? I, I think this is an equally fascinating topic because this thing's only going to propagate. And so now take my 13 year olds and fast forward them, you know, se seven years and they're in the middle of college graduating. Like, how do they how do they see the world? How do they interact with the world? What, do they even care if this was human generated uh, thought content or machine? It helped them so get their assignment done. Got it done. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It's, it sounds like you're saying of all your kids, none of them have created a mental mechanism for vetting what's real, what's not, for pressing their thinking. <laughs> I think the millennials have. You know, I think my think my 30, 31 and 34 year olds have. And did they and, did they by the time they were 13 or 14? No, no. So how does this differ? Yeah, well, well, you're right. You're right. I mean, and and you know, back in their day, they were hiding their MySpace websites from me <laughs> because I was terrified of online predators, right? And like, please, <laughs> for the love of God, don't post a photo. It's there forever. And now um, every photo my my new teenagers post, it's it's the most rudest, horrific face modified morphing that they just think's hysterical and it triggers giggle and laughter. So, you know, my fears as to what's the right thing to do or not are dissipating. But, you know, you 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 read some of the old classic novels and you get a real sense of the author and how they see the world and how they put together things and what their profound perspectives are. The thought leaders of the future. Is that even a thing? Is there even such a thing as thought leading? I have no idea. Yeah, but it's not. We don't have that. I mean, what this, the, what was being described as, as being as as going to the authorities and all the rest of that stuff. We we've, we've now learned that going to the most respected authority might not be the best thing to do. Right. And uh, or may not be the what may not be the person that or person or institution that had been in the past yes. considered the authority yeah I mean, it's, a, it's a much broader uh population of authorities now well and it's you know and when i've had this argument before with others uh somebody helped me it turned a light bulb on for me the authority whatever that means and that magical word that that it means to me in my generation that authority now is look you're either navigating to the store using ways or google maps and it tells you to turn left now that's all the authority you need. Authority has been boiled down to that moment in time. It's highly transactional and it's in context to need. Mm -hmm. Yes, whereas in the past, that would be. Uh, there would be social dynamics behind that decision, right? Yeah. There's also this perennial battle uh, over the controlling narrative for whatever culture you're in or whatever situation you're in. And I, I think, Brad, you're ruining the fact that reason and logic might be losing the battle to, to be that authority. And, and, and historically, the winners are the best storytellers and uh, the, the, yep. the, the stories that Great we point. adopt. And, and many of the stories that we adopt are illogical, violent, and crazy ass, if you ask me. Yeah. Um, and we seem to think that's pretty normal. And our cultures absolutely normalize and praise those things and cause us to uh, swear our allegiance to those crazy stories. Uh, in fact, small side note, a couple of years ago, I realized that and, and uh, that acts of faith, and I'm thinking here about you know the the catechism in the in the Catholic Church in the Catholic faith or, or whatever else. Um, acts of faith are very intentional oaths sworn to believe something that is clearly unbelievable and, and bears no sense of logic that is that is forces you to deny fact, science, and truth as part of joining a tribe and being a member of a tribe you don't want to be ostracized from because chances are the rest of your people are all members of that tribe because that's how social circles yes. run. And so and so so acts of faith are 
are in, in a dark way of seeing them, intentional ways of loosening people from science, facts, and logic. Right. And 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 it's like, and, oh shit, I got that. And it okay, also so somebody, is so somebody died and was resurrected three days later, transmogrified water into wine. Uh, like like th those things are all ways of separating us from facts. There was a great interpretation of uh, that loaves and fishes story uh, mm -hmm. by a woman priest, um, a woman, uh, yeah, bishop. And, um, and she said, how could this happen? How could it happen to be true that if there was a grand sharing of food, how might that have happened? And maybe the simple act, maybe it was just a, uh, you know, it wasn't that five, what, two loaves and five fishes or whatever it was. Fed 5,000 uh, people. Fed 5,000 people was that they fed each other. They shared what they had among each other. That it was, it was, the practice it was a stone soup in, incident? Pardon? It was just, mis it was a stone soup incident. It was just misreported. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, well it's a stone know. soup. Yeah, I mean that's that's a parable. But but to go back to you know some of our other favorite stories or things that were miracles, they don't have to be miracles to be uh, miraculous. Miraculous, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Lovely. I'm glad we've solved all these things. Well, I was trying to stick in. I was like a conversation that, that this echoed from this weekend where. Um, I was in a in my sangha and, and we were discussing Buddhism and I think Buddhism is so fascinating right because you have several thousand years of people trying to convince other people of that you shouldn't need to convince other people kind of so it's a very funny kind of thing but uh, one of the one of the you know very smart people in the group was talking about how he was so excited about modern physics and the relationship to Buddhism and and I was struck by this, like, it felt to me like he was saying there must be kind of a, there's a truth between, because they're tied, they're related to each other. Um, and I was like, really? They're just two metaphors that happen to happen at the same time. And, and I just find it interesting to, like, I don't know, maybe they're actually, there's a truth underlying them, or maybe it just happens that these ideas become popular simultaneously. And then the fact that they reinforce each other probably makes them more influential. And I, I don't know what, what it would have been in the time of Christ or something, or whenever, but, you know, 900 years later or something when Christianity became really popular, you know, what ideas were floating around in the ether at that moment that, like, you know, Christianity works and there's some other set of ideas around, you know, I don't know, eating blood or something like that, that, you know, everybody says, yeah, yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> and you, you remember the Tao of physics, right? Which is 1975, uh, Fritjof Capra. Um, who was saying these things as well. And then I watched, if you guys haven't seen it, Mind Walk, uh, which is, I don't know, 20 or 30 years old, a movie uh, like John, uh, Sam Waterston's in it and uh, Liv Ullman. And it's, uh, Fritjot Capra was, was like one of the writers on the script. It's trying to make physics popular. I guess it's like a, you know, TikTok in the age where you can do it for two hours. But it's fascinating. I think we have reached a gentle conclusion hey, for the day. Yeah. You think we've hit peak generative AI? <laughs> um, cool. That's right. Mind walk. Nice. Uh, 1990, which is based on the book, The Turning Point. By Fritjof Capra, right? Um, thanks, everybody. It was really um, fun and useful and interesting and scary, all those things at once. All at once, yeah, it was. <laughs> Thank you. So let's and, be uh, careful out here. All right. See you next month. Hey, Susan, so, yeah. if you do have thanks somebody, reunion. if you have yeah. somebody you could explain Linux. The, the Linux Foundation governance. I would really love to meet them. I don't so if you if you have a okay, name, I'll reach uh, out to them or something. If there's, yeah, I I could, so I'm sure I could figure it out on my own, but I don't want them too late. So, so Dave, consider pinging Brian Bailendorf, who's yeah, uh, I've pretty... talked to Brian a little bit about this stuff, and I found yeah. it a little hard to pull it out of him. Um, I've got lots okay. of insights, but I mean, 
you know, somebody must understand the business model of Linux. And I don't know. Like, well, there's a woman named Libby Bishop, who's may, may be retired by now. Everybody I know is retired. Uh, who did her thesis on Linux, and um, she was an economist. So there's must. Let me just reach out. That would be great. Yeah, okay. maybe I can find her thesis. I'll look around. Libby Bishop. Yes, Elizabeth Bishop. Elizabeth. And she's currently, I think, in in England, although she's American. Thanks so much. Great. Okay. Let me know if you. Thanks, everyone. Okay. All right. I'll report we'll that. All right. Thanks.